Hi, my name is Joe, and I'm one of the pastors of Redeemer Lincoln Square. Now, let me read for you today's passage, which comes from Deuteronomy chapter 12. Let me read for you verses 8 through 14. You are not to do as we do here today, everyone doing as they see fit, since you have not yet reached the resting place and the inheritance the Lord your God is giving you. But you will cross the Jordan and settle in the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and he will give you rest from all your enemies around you so that you will live in safety. Then to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling place for his name, there you are to bring everything I command you, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, and all the choice possessions you have vowed to the Lord. And there rejoice before the Lord your God, you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levites from your towns who have no allotment or inheritance of their own. Be careful not to sacrifice your burnt offerings anywhere you please. Offer them only at the place the Lord will choose in one of your tribes, and there observe everything I command you. Amen. Now, as I read uh, this passage, I think it's asking the question, how are we to worship God? Right? And that's the question uh, that the people of God needed to answer. Um, because, as you know, uh, they've been... Uh, traveling through the wilderness and they are about to enter into uh, the land that God had promised them. And so as they were on the road, so to speak, they had the tabernacle uh, where God's presence descended and there they uh, uh, had an encounter with God. They experienced uh, God's glory as he led them through the wilderness. And so they're asking the question of, okay, so as we are about to enter into this land, you know, what are some things that we need to remember about how to worship uh, this God. And I think the question is pertinent for us uh, today as well. Uh, all of us have been removed from our usual physical uh, place of worship. And so we're asking, okay, what, what does it mean for us to uh, worship God uh, in the here and now in light of everything that's happening around us, in light of where we are? And uh, really, the, the question it comes down to is, if we were to put it another way, how can we worship in a way that is going to be both pleasing to God, but also in a way that's going to make a difference and an impact uh, in our lives? And I, here, here's, uh, here's what I think we learn uh, from this passage, is that our worship ought to be marked by two things. On the one hand, our worship needs to be marked by delight. Uh, on the other hand, our worship also at the same time needs to be marked by sobriety, uh, delight, and sobriety. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, <clears throat> first, our worship needs to be marked by delight. If you look at verse 12, after uh, giving the people of God instructions on, uh, uh, on how to worship and a location to worship God in, uh, it says, there, at that place, rejoice before the Lord your God. That is the first command that comes in terms of how they ought to worship. It needs to be marked by rejoicing or delight. Now, what does that mean for us? Now, when we think about rejoicing in God, when we think about delighting in God, we usually think about the worship experience that most of us are used to on Sundays. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we think about the kind of music that invokes a certain kind of emotion in us. We think about an inspirational sermon uh, that we may hear that moves our hearts. Uh, for others of us, and this is kind of where I miss uh, worshiping with uh, many of you uh, in person the most, we think about uh, doing all of these things together in a congregation uh, of people that we are physically together uh, doing these things that has some kind of a power to evoke certain kinds of emotions and an experience within us. Now, all of those things are legitimate. All of those things are valuable. Uh, but specifically in the context of this passage, we get another aspect of worship that I think is important for us to remember. And it's to remember God's work in our midst and especially in our lives uh, individually, uh, but also as a collective. 
because if you look at um, verse 10, it says, You will cross the Jordan and settle in the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and he will give you rest from all your enemies around you so that you will live in safety. Here, God is giving instructions to his people, and he's saying, you, you know, when you get to this place, here's what you're going to do. You're going to look back and remember the fact that I have caused you to cross over, uh, cross the Jordan, and take possession of the land that I'm giving you as an inheritance, and I'm giving you this land to you. And on top of that, I'm going to give you rest from your enemies. Rest from the enemies that surround you and you will live in safety. When you think about the inheritance that God has given to you, when you think about the rest that God is about to give to you, when you think about the safety uh, in which you live uh, because of what God has done for you, as you remember those things, he's saying, as you remember those things, rejoice in this God. And we are called to do the same. As new covenant people of God, we are called to remember the works of God in our lives. Not just uh, the wonderful ways in which he had made his goodness and his grace and his mercy apparent in our lives through the circumstances of our lives. We are called to uh, ultimately remember the work of God on the cross in his son Jesus Christ on our behalf. Right, uh, That on the cross he delivered us. Uh, from sin and death, on, that on the cross he uh, uh, secured for us uh, the presence and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that uh, each one of us who trust in Jesus is now able to enjoy uh, because of uh, his work on the cross and the Holy Spirit that is with us, who is encouraging us and empowering us and is uh, guaranteeing that we will never be left alone as orphans, but rather can enjoy now our status as children of God. We can now go, call God Father. All of those things that have been secured for us, as we remember these works of God, uh, God is calling us to rejoice in Him, delight in Him. Now, that's something that we can do even if we are isolated from uh, one another physically. Even as we get together virtually uh, in a digital space, uh, this is something that we can do, something that we can do individually on our own as well. And so we are called to delight in this God as we remember his work in our lives. But secondly, at the same time, we are called to worship uh, in a way that is marked by sobriety. If you look at verse 8, it says, You are not to do as we do here today, everyone doing as they see fit. To give you a little bit of context, these people were on the road, and they were uh, called to worship in a very specific way. Uh, but what we get uh, from this verse is that they didn't worship God in a way that was prescribed uh, by God, but everybody just kind of had their own worship experience as they saw fit. Now, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that these people, um, they, were in, they were engaging with God in a way that made sense to them, in a way that was convenient for them, in a way that, in ways that they saw fit, as we see uh, in this text. Now, what do we learn from that? Well, I think, um, <clears throat> You know, there's uh, a lot of ways in which, and, you know, I may be guilty of this as a, a, a minister myself, uh, the message that we get from a lot of our churches is that, um, that God is available for you anytime you want to access Him. And a lot of times our worship can be marked by the self uh, more than it is marked by a reverence uh, for this God. And that, is, that was the same danger, that was the uh, same temptation that the people of God at the time were faced with. And so here in this specific passage, uh, the people of God are given specific instructions. Uh, he's, you know, they're being told, uh, don't, worship, don't just worship in any way that you see fit. Rather, there is a very specific location uh, in which uh, your worship needs to be centered. And it is going to be a place that is marked out by God himself, where his name, his presence, his essence, his uh, character, his attributes, uh, his glory will dwell. And that's what we see in this passage. 
Now, what does that mean for us today, right? How, how uh, is our worship uh, uh, going to be marked by sobriety? If for the people of God, they are to worship at a certain location. Well, we get a hint of that in uh, the New Testament in John chapter 4. Now, for those of you that may remember, uh, Jesus goes and meets with a, a woman uh, at the well, and they get into this discussion about proper worship. And uh, the Samaritan woman says, well, uh, you know, our ancestors, we worshiped at a certain location. We know that you uh, Jews uh, worshiped, had your place of worship in Jerusalem. Now, which place is the right place? And Jesus sidesteps the question altogether. And here's what he says in verse 21. It says, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth truth. Here's what Jesus is saying. Because of what Jesus has come to do, there is now no longer a need for the people of God to congregate to a certain location to worship. And if you know anything about kind of Old Testament history leading up to this point, because they were displaced, uh, removed from their uh, uh, place of worship, there was this a longing in their hearts to one day go to a certain location in which they can experience this presence of God and worship Him. But Jesus is saying, I came to do something that is utterly different. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, because of Jesus' work on the cross, now He gives us His Holy Spirit. And if you were to trust in this Holy Spirit, then we can now worship Him in spirit and in truth. We can worship Him with the Holy Spirit that resides in our hearts now, but we can also worship this God in truth, with integrity, because of the truths uh, that are revealed to us uh, in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So here's what this means, friends. There ought to be a sense of sobriety that marks our worship. Because it is nothing less than Jesus Christ himself who secured, who secured for us um, this presence of God within our hearts. Now, if you were to see that, then we would be uh, moved uh, to have a sense of sobriety before this God. Because this God is holy. And it's nothing less than the cross of Jesus Christ to secure your salvation, to secure your deliverance, to secure your standing before him. But at the same time, you will be moved to delight in this God because he was glad to go to the cross for you. Now, as you remember the cross and see, both of those things meet at the cross. And so we come to the foot of the cross and we remember his works before works for us. Then it'll move us to delight. It'll move us to a sense of sobriety and reverence of this God. And that is the worship that our God seeks from those who trust in him. And so friends, even during this time, let us go to the foot of the cross and worship this God, a worship that is pleasing to him. And as we worship him in this way, our lives will be changed as well. And so may all people of God in all seasons come to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so let's do that together.